Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, program, our first uh, artist panel to launch the first uh, Asia Society Triennial. We do not dream alone. My name is Bunhui Tan, and I am the artistic director of the Triennial and the exhibition co-curator. The basic or rather fundamental uh, artistic uh, purpose of the Triennial really is to use art to conceptualize and to manifest the sort of response that uh, many people around the world have now against the general trend towards isolationism and tribalism with its attendant eels, evils of racism, the fear of outsiders, the scapegoating of the nomad and the migrant, the religious, sexual, gender minority. The great critic Edwin Said had once uh, in a lecture uh, disputing when he was challenging uh, Fukuyama's idea of the end of history, he had spoken about how uh, in many nations there is a mainstream or orthodox culture and how cultural development actually never comes from this mainstream or orthodox culture, but rather from the fringe or non-orthodox culture. Orthodox culture often aligned with conservative uh, movements or traditionalist movements, sometimes they are, the word appears, often refer back to a kind of golden age which frequently never existed. And their idea of, well, progress in this sense is to return to that idyllic golden age, that sort of, you know, almost fantastic uh, point in time when their culture was pure, was homogenous, was not contaminated by, you know, uh, all the sort of vagrants and, and enemies of the fringe. Fringe culture often comes in Said's uh, uh, lecture from people such as intellectuals and artists, as well as minority cultures, those that challenge the orthodox mainstream. So the current sort of debate over globalization is really interesting because the triennial makes the proposition that globalization or rather globalism is not a stage of historical development, but rather, you know, it's more appropriately seen as a condition of our, exist of our existence now. Contemporary artistic practice is in a sense a resistance against isolationism because whether we like it or not, the work of many contemporary artists prove or demonstrate or work out this idea that you know, concepts, peoples and objects are connected. They are all connected by a complex web of associations that are often hidden or not brought into the light. It is in this sense that I think art is vital today as mainstream public institutions often fail to connect or convey the links associations and relations between us. Art, therefore, is also a way to think through these complex issues of how we are related, how we are associated with each other, how we mutually define and constitute each other. So I'm very proud to introduce the three artists or three groups uh, of artists that we have uh, today, tonight, depending on where you are, whose practice, you know, and whose work in the triennial is an act of helping us think through these complex issues that we find ourselves in, while at the same time, you know, resisting this idea that we all live in a kind of isolated container. No frogs ever live in their own well. They will simply perish from loneliness and lack of sustenance. So I'm very happy to have with us today Kavok Murad, Nassim Nasser, and Ken and Julia Yonatani, three artists who are showing right now at uh, the Asia Society Triennial. So this evening, I'm very happy to start by introducing Nassim Nasser. Uh, the full bio of all the artists is on the website. I'm not going to uh, spend time reading it. Uh, not, safe to say that Nassim is a really uh, wonderful artist uh, whom I met many years ago down under in Australia. And now she lives in, in Melbourne uh, and she's of Persian and Iranian uh, descent. And first, I would like to uh, ask Nassim as well as the other 
artists in sequence to say a little bit and introduce to the audiences. And of course, because of COVID, many people have not been to see the show to talk about their practice, you know, what, uh, what you know, makes them tick. Uh, so Nasim, can I ask you, you know, as an artist of Persian descent, and I, I don't want to be essentialist here, but, you know, an artist from a specific culture, who is now living and working in Australia, and we know you're speaking to us from Melbourne. Your work, when I first saw it many years ago, seemed to be also about deconstructing or rather uh, peeling away the hidden coats of the culture of your, your, your origin of Persian culture to outsiders, you know, including myself, uh, especially as they relate to the lives and the experiences of women. Could you tell us a bit about how your movement to Australia has affected, if any, your thinking and practice, and especially with regard to the culture that you grew up with? Of course. And what is your expectation, you know, uh, from us, from, from, from audiences such as myself who are not familiar with, with Persian culture, with the codes and the, the, the visual metaphors that you are showing in your work? Sure. Thank you so much, um, Boon Hui um, and the team. Um, I have to quickly thank you because it's such a difficult time and surreal for all of us to be distanced but enjoy the exhibition. Um, and um, so, hello, everybody. Um, I Maybe I just go through the beginning of my uh, practice in Australia. Um, I grew up in a culture um, in Iran, of course, where there was um, uh, massive limitations for women uh, in public to never expose um, the skin or uh, if you ever expose any part of your body apart from your face and hand as a woman, you will be um, extremely visible and uh, you'll be looked at as a strange and unaccepted um, um, person in public. So when I moved to Australia, knowing and understanding that uh, severe limitation that one woman would face or is facing still in Iran, um, I moved to Australia to study and further um, research my life and experiences. And I found myself in a completely nude beach um, <laughs> in South Australia. And I remember I was walking on that nude beach, seeing all the signs telling me you are not allowed to wear anything. Um, and and I just, that was the moment in 2009 that I felt the whole paradox and completely contrast of two cultures. One that I was growing up, up until my age of, like I would say my youth, and then my um, adulthood started in Australia where I was absolutely visible in a culture of you can expose you, you can be visible, you can definitely um, wear nothing, on a, especially on particular beaches. And then if you're wearing something on that particular beach, you'll be very, very visible. So this whole black and white started to um, capture my head that this is where I want to go with my practice and talk about the cultural differences between East and West and how much they accept each other or reject each other, in particularly with my experience coming from Middle East, Iran, um, to Australia, where you have the freedom you want to gain, but at the same time, you have this shadow of your past capturing you and making you extremely visible. Um, therefore, that freedom gained is no longer a freedom. Um, so I started uh, profoundly with video work and then with uh, do photographs. The slides now? Do we want to show this, your slides now? Yes, please. Um, the, the, the performance. The first the first... 
Yeah. Yes, please. So this, um, for example, um, the start of my practice in Australia in 2009 was with uh, dealing with these two paradoxes of how visible and invisible you could be in both cultures and how much you, your, the meaning uh, of something for you would change and shift. Um, so I started looking at the women as in, in covered and wrapped up in a different way. Um, even though my work is completely, can be looked at very political, but it's very much for me a cultural um, unwrapping that culture where that visibility of showing your skin is no longer visible in, in the West. Um, and the other way around, and if you are wrapped up, you are absolutely visible. And um, so from that point, I started using many obje objects and actions in my videos. For example, the worry beads and, and or the beshgen, which is a Persian way of celebration that I can just do a few of them for you. And how much this resonate as something celebratory in, in the Middle East. And then when I represent this in the West, it looks at as something very like aggressive and, and unsettling. And this is doesn't mean the celebration anymore. And, uh, and I love this shifting of meanings that happens in two cultures. And the worry bits itself, which I am right now holding one, <laughs> because... Um, <laughs> I sing the anxiety when I'm talking and, and that this is no longer has the meaning that my grandparents hold, which was more about spirituality and, um, and, and a therapy in a different way or praying. But this more is for me a shadow from my past uh, that lost its meaning now and is faded from uh, what was originally in my mind, but what is now in the West. Um, if that makes sense of this whole black and white is it slowly after 10 years of living in Australia has moved to shades of grey now and is no <laughs> longer white. <laughs> so that's, um, that, that is for me right now is passing while I'm talking, I'm just trying to pass my anxiety. But this literally was made historically for a dream come true. So you count 33 beats, um, hoping your dream would get closer to come true. And that's how it's originated in many, many religions uh, from Christianity to Buddhism and to Ju Judaism. And they all have different meanings, but the object is one thing, and that's the worry bit. So I'm fascinated by all of these differences and mm. how much they accept each other or reject each other to bring the two meanings in one work or just leave it to audience to judge. Mm. Well, and, and what's really fascinating to me is, you know, it, it seems you're taking like, in, like you said, one object, something that is very, very specific. But I think what's really wondrous about the work, especially the multi-screen work, is is to be able to show in a kind of without a lot of polemical uh, explanation how even this object, this very simple object that has had a lot of cultural different cultural meanings is very specific to a culture, but is also shared by many different religious traditions in, in the place in the Middle East region where you, you come from. I think that that's really uh, sort of, uh, you know, fascinating to me because it's a kind of also saying that you can't be a well, you can't be your own frog in the well, that you, you're not you can't be just by yourself and you are the reason or you're the explanation for your, your existence. I think that's really fascinating. Absolutely, precisely. I would say um, just coming to Australia for the last 10 years and looking back uh, and unwrapping um, specific objects or actions that resonated in one culture absolutely differently to another, for me also, I come to this point that there is no fixed meaning for anything. Mm -hmm. And literally things slowly would shift and there's no right and wrong about how you see 
um, I think maybe back then I was very criticizing the um, invisibility of women in, in Iran and Middle East. But now uh, the whole meaning is shifting for me the more I live in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, and also it's similar with objects I use in my performances or video art or photography. Okay. So all drags in together That's and fantastic. shifting. And that's a perfect, uh, you know, to talk about the shifting meanings. I think that's a perfect moment to shift to to Ken and Julia Yonatani, who are uh, dialing in from uh, Kyoto, Japan at the moment. Uh, and, and I first knew of their work through a, a commission in the uh, Singapore Biennale some years ago. So Ken and Julia, uh, y- your work, I think, has has really, you know, is about looking to me personally is about, in a sense, trying to interrogate the meaning of certain things, certain decisions that humanity has made. I mean, one of the focuses of your work seems to be always around, uh, you know, not just environmental safety, but the relationship between man and, and the environment. And you are always using very simple materials as a basis for interrogating that. You know, in the Adelaide Biennial, you know, I, there was the work around salt, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and its effect on the water table. Of course, you, you dealt with the uranium glass as a material. And here, you know, in the Asia Society Triennial, you return to that, but specifically in the context of Fukushima, you know, so you're, you seem very concerned about how humanity is using the resources of the earth, not just in a physical sense, but also the cultural and social ramifications of that. And at the same time, you know, your work is very research-based and you often work very closely with the scientific and engineering communities. Uh, why is this method, you know, very important to you, like using... Uh, working with scientific research and 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 how do you think your role as artist helps to in a sense reframe or extend or add to that conversation that science already you know the scientists are already uh, bringing to 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 the fore. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so many good questions for so mm. early in the morning. <laughs> I thought I'll just get them all out in <laughs> class. Uh, so I'm Julia and this is Ken. Ken um, and we're talking to you from uh, Kyoto uh, in the countryside where we ha- also have uh, an organic farm. Uh, so Yes, uh, most of our work uh, is, or a lot of our work is environmentally based, uh, looking at uh, maybe how to reconnect um, in what we see as a disconnected world. So in that way, perhaps it does relate to um, also the connection of cultures. Uh, Obviously, uh, we have a multicultural household. Um, We were both born in Tokyo, uh, I was born in Tokyo uh, to Australian uh, parents, but my, my, my mother is also uh, originally from uh, South Africa of Jewish heritage and um, Ken, obviously Japanese. And we traveled, uh, we took it for granted that we could travel uh, to places. Um, in February, we were undertaking a residency in Shigaraki, uh, mm-hmm. which is uh, a beautiful ceramics facility in Japan that has massive kilns uh, and lots of overseas guests. Uh, and then when uh, COVID hit, uh, gradually the artists became less and less. It was like the monkeys on the bed <laughs> <laughs> until there was none left. <laughs> um, and we were just left there with our work sitting there. Uh, we were supposed to be coming to New York and having a show at Mizuma Gallery and opening uh, the triennials, tri- triennials, the triennial. So it's really great that it's finally happening and we're just really sorry that we, we can't be there. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but what was really uh, kind of, I don't think coincidental, Ken always says that there's no coincidences, but um, uh, important at the time was that we were making a work called uh, Dysbiotica, looking at 
uh, the breakdown in balance of uh, microorganisms and their systems uh, and how this can affect uh, human bodies as well. Mm. Uh, it's actually the next slide that you can see it in, sorry. But um, yeah, that, so it's the, it's the work in the foreground. Um, we were using clay, which Ken originally was a ceramicist. And uh, so we were kind of going back to his original um, expertise and uh, it's tiny, uh, can't really see well, but bits of coral, uh, coral-like formations um, that are also inspired by um, our own microbiome. We had an opportunity to go uh, to a um, facility in Queensland that you can look at um, very, very small objects using uh, electron microscope in the uh, Queensland University technology. And um, we worked with scientists there looking at our own microbiome and from that we gained inspiration uh, to make this work. Um, and originally we, we were interested in the human microbiome from actually uh, our kind of art project which we began uh, four years ago, uh, which is organic farming. Um, we started it as a kind of an art project and it's gotten way too big. <laughs> but um, we were looking at, we really became <clears throat> inspired by the change in the soil and how soil originally was just basically dead. It had nothing in it. Um, it was just dead from uh, pesticides, herbicides and chemical fertilizers and it was chemical fertilizers which were used to um, for all the nutrients for, for any plants that were growing there. Um, but we tried to regenerate the soil and bring back the microbes and bring back life to the soil um, in a way that you can't see with your own eyes. Um, and the change in the soil, we also gradually also noticed a change in our own health. Um, and then we became very interested in how those things are connected. And recently with uh, uh, genetic sequencing, they have really discovered that humans are not just humans. We are actually also made up of, of uh, millions and trillions of different microorganisms, including viruses um, that we didn't know about. They didn't we didn't know they existed inside our bodies. Uh, on our skin, in our mouth, in our nose, uh, in every place you can imagine, <laughs> including your stomach, uh, which obviously is really um, important for, for your immune system. Uh, so it was really kind of ironic that we were looking at this uh, as COVID happened and all the monkeys disappeared from the bed and we couldn't go to New York and we couldn't go to Australia and suddenly we were stuck in Japan and um, I couldn't even get back into Japan if I left. Uh, they, had, they started a, a rule where foreigners couldn't come back again, even if you have residency here. So then suddenly, uh, you know, your, your position, uh, to, uh, thinking of Nassim was, was precarious, you know, as, as a, as a foreigner in a country that you were born in, but have never been accepted in. So, uh, do you want to say something? Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, the neighbor thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, dramat the world is dramatically changed, but uh, uh, our view of the world- Oh, you need to explain the work. Oh, yeah. Mm. Uh, the, can you back to the uh, picture of our work? Please. <clears throat> the work in the in the uh, yeah uh, the work in the yeah the butterfly. Uh, as Julia said, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You have to explain about this work. Yeah, <laughs> the the work uh, we showing in the Torinare, uh, we actually uh, uh, made a beautiful uh, music box with a uh, uh, little figure and uh, uh, the uh, butterfly wings. So this butterfly wing, actually, uh, we uh, had a collaboration with uh, the scientists in Okinawa. 
Japan, uh, the University of Ryukyu, uh, Otaki Laboratory. Uh, the, the team actually are uh, researching about uh, mutant butterfly uh, effective uh, uh, of uh, radiation uh, with a little uh, butterfly in Fukushima. And uh, <clears throat> we actually uh, got the uh, uh, butterfly eggs from them and uh, raised and then uh, uh, actually uh, uh, the eggs it, uh, uh, became uh, a beautiful butterfly. And uh, after the butterfly died, uh, we actually made a specimen of them and then uh, put the wing uh, onto the little figure. And uh, uh, what they researching about is uh, uh, they actually uh, uh, looking at the, uh, its DNA, and and uh, uh, behold, uh, they uh, looking at the uh, DNA changes uh, before and after of Fukushima, uh, you know, uh, radiation uh, issues. And uh, some butterflies is uh, uh, actually uh, most of the species, you know, the, the butterfly, the number of the butterfly is died out. And then uh, 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 after that, so uh, quite a few butterflies left, but uh, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, they found the mutant butterflies, but uh, uh, the butterfly generation is, uh, uh, in one season, in the summer, uh, it's equivalent of uh, humans' uh, uh, seven generations. So uh, we had a collaboration with them uh, in 2014. So at that time, uh, already uh, 400 years equivalent of uh, uh, human history. So, yeah, and they said, uh, so after uh, uh, Fukushima uh, explosion 2011, so in four years, uh, they found uh, uh, mu uh, you know, a mutant butterfly, but also uh, uh, quite a few butterflies uh, survived. And then it's uh, it's like uh, uh, the super super butterflies. It's really strong. So uh, Julia and Ken, uh, why in the three wishes work? You know, there's there's the bit what you described. You know about about mm -hmm. science and and the mutation. But you know you mounted it. Uh, the wings of the the mutated butterfly onto onto a, a sculpture of basically Tinkerbell, you know. Uh, uh, why, why, for example, you know, did you uh, uh, sort of conflate the two? Why the association between that and the cultural realm of you know basically Walt Disney and 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 you know popular culture uh, in general? Yeah, so um, we uh, love collaborating uh, with scientists. At the same time, uh, originally, I've never studied art, um, never went to art school, unfortunately. I'd love to go still. <laughs> um, uh, so my uh, background is in history. I was actually um, a lecturer in Japanese history. Um, so a lot of our work goes back to kind of history. And we were lo I was looking at... Um, the history of nuclear power uh, and became really fascinated by the role that Disney played uh, in Japan, especially uh, with trying to change. Obviously, Japan did not have a positive view of nuclear power uh, in the post-war period. Uh, so they were involved with trying to change uh, the pers perspectives of, of the, the general population uh, to one that would be more positive uh, towards the role that nuclear power can play in the generation of electricity, as opposed to uh, the role that nuclear power had played uh, in, in the ending of the Second World War. Uh, so um, Disney uh, commissioned uh, scientists to um, write this book, uh, Our Friend, uh, The Atom. 
And uh, then they turned it into a movie, an educational kind of animation. And uh, the book is really fascinating uh, as a kind of a, a glimpse on the attitude towards nuclear power at the time as a, a kind of a genie. Um, that's what it's depicted as. And it's a genie that uh, brings humanity three wishes. Uh, so that's where the, the title of the work, Three Wishes, comes from. And the, uh, the wishes that are granted uh, humanity is the wish uh, for peace, for world peace. Nuclear power can be a free uh, power, source of power so that the world uh, doesn't have to have wars anymore. Uh, the wish for health, uh, the way in which um, nuclear uh, isotopes can be used in health. They actually have a picture in, in the book of someone swallowing iodine. <laughs> so it's kind of view that, that, yeah. that it was very healthy. <laughs> and, um, and the wish uh, for, um, for energy, the wish for um, eternal free energy. Uh, so that's where the, the title Three Wishes comes from. Obviously we're using it in a little bit of ironic way. Um, and yeah, that's, that's where the history comes from uh, in, in the 1950s. Yeah, I mean, to me, when I first encountered it, I thought it was really fascinating that, that in this case, you know, the, the sort of assimilation or the acceptance of, of nuclear power is very clearly, you know, the way that you have thought through it is it's also there's a part that is purely like scientific, like it, it achieves, it gives you power. But there's an, another part that is, is cultural, that, that in the sense culture or society has to interpret it or understand it in a certain way in order for it to be to be uh, accepted. So you know, and and the book you're referring to, I mean, we're displaying a copy of the book, and and the term, the the illustration of the atomic genius is is is, is quite uh, you know, I mean, you're a little startled by it, and okay. and the book is actually a very good book, and okay. so is that 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 PBS. I mean, basically, it's a PBS document, public broadcasting service uh 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 program is really fascinating so this idea that that you know science is also not not just merely a kind of technical or, or engineering development but also a kind of there is a kind of cultural change that occurs alongside uh occurs alongside it i i think this you know this this for your work sort of suggests that you know we look at even things that we think are just factual are just hard, like this thing A causes B, but there is there is this other sort of context that is not just uh, restricted to the realm of of the hard sciences. I, I think that's that's really fascinating in at this moment, you know, when we are we're all looking for answers. So it's almost suggesting that you know the answers may come from you know, it's much, the solutions may be a little broader. Our thinking may also have to go beyond just mainly, you know, just looking at science alone. So finally, let's not uh, forget, uh, let's quickly turn to, to, to Kavok. Uh, Kavok Murad, uh, who as an American artist of Syrian American descent, you know, Kavok, you, you, uh, you are actually uh, even better known in, in, in this part of the world for your work in performance. And, and certainly in Europe uh, and in Asia, you're quite well known, whether in, in music or in opera. And I know that you literally are, uh, was trying to open uh, a project that with the uh, National Opera in, in Korea, even as you were installing the work uh, for the triennial. And, you know, I was quite struck at the same time by how, you know, how much border crossing, this idea of crossing borders is so central to your practice, you know, crossing borders, crossing cultures, crossing genres, and many of the visual imagery in your work, you know, while they, they depict, you know, sometimes specific localities from your life, for example, you know, elements from, from Aleppo where you, 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 you 
you spend much of your growing years, but they are never literal representations. So they are a kind of, of synthesis of specific places and time. So could you talk a bit more about uh, your, how would you describe your practice and in particular your, your relationship to music because you've done a lot of work in musical performance and, and we know you're the only visual artist in the Silk Road uh, Ensemble. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm speaking from Worcester in the hotel room. I'm here visiting at Holy Cross uh, College to create my next uh, installation. So um, thank you so much. It has been an incredible honor to be part of the Triennial. I was there witnessing incredible works. Uh, I was next to Ken and Julia's work. I heard, I heard that incredible uh, music. It, it's in my head still. And of course, Nassim's work was next to next to me too. So it was like kind of without meeting, I feel like I met you guys. I feel like I'm where this incredible family, beautifully curated. It was just a moving, moving experience to be there. So thank you for everyone who worked so beautifully and seamlessly to create this exhibition. So I grew up in Aleppo, Syria. I come from American, uh, so sorry, Armenian descent. My ancestors, my grandparents, they were forced to leave uh, historic Armenia, which is Turkey today, and we end up uh, being first refugees in Syria. Uh, growing up in Syria, uh, you will definitely learn, you have to kind of practice your uh, uh, language as an Arabic speaking and also Armenian at home, and you'll learn Turkish and you'll learn Kurdish. So Syria is this melting pot of different cultures and gave me an incredible foundation to understand what, uh, what is storytelling. So I consider myself modern day storytelling. When you were, if you had to, like in the past went to Syria, if you went to a coffee shop, you definitely, I'm pretty sure in Iran, the same thing, Nassim, uh, the same thing in Iran, when you go to a coffee shop, you see this storyteller, it incredibly animates this thing before the, the TV, it just tells a story from a book. So, uh, my grandfather, when he arrived to northern part of Syria, which is uh, mainly uh, populated by Kurdish people, he learned Kurdish and he started composing music on string instrument and singing Kurdish. So growing up for me, that was a big part of uh, influence. So when I went to the art school in Armenia, I studied uh, illustration. Somehow it ended up, I was wanting to illustrate sound. Even though at the beginning was a silly idea, but the lines, my lines, when I was creating and listening to music, I noticed that it's changing. So with that, I experimented a little bit in Armenia, where the first experiment was at the first Biennale in Armenia, it was in the second uh, biggest city called Gumri. And there, my good friend, he was playing a trombone, and I was without preparation, I was following his sound and creating the lines, and he was getting influenced by the lines. So then slowly I developed this idea and then without even thinking, it became, it became big. So I was invited to be part of the Silk Road Ensemble. My very first trip as an American, I got my American citizenship 2005 and I went to NARA, NARA Museum and I did uh, uh, work with them. So when um, I migrated to the United States as uh, first, first project was uh, with Kinan Azmi Home Within, uh, I think if we go back in the in the slides, I will uh, show the I'm on the stage with the clarinet player. That's my this one, the, this no, the one before. Um, Can we show the slides? The slides, yes, this this slide, this one. Home within. I wanted to capture if you're forced to leave your home, which happens to many many cultures, unfortunately. What do you take with you? The, the only intuitive thing I can say, you can take your memories so you can start everything new in this new culture. So in this performance, uh, it's dedicated to the many people who forced to leave Syria. And I dedicated this piece to many Syrians who migrated to find a safer place. And this project with Kinan Azme, we toured maybe 70 different uh, venues around the world. And after that, I did this uh, project, which is uh, very interesting, Handel's Israel in Egypt. Uh, it's uh, inspired by, or, or it's written from the Exodus, which is a story of uh, a biblical story 3,000 years ago when Israelites forced to leave Egypt. 
So when they approached me to create this work with uh, amazing Los Angeles Master Corel at the Disney Hall, I wanted to put three different stories in it. First, the Exodus, which is 3,000 years ago. Second, my ancestors, 100 years ago, they were forced to leave their home. And the third, the refugee crisis. So it's, it's what's unfortunate, this thing is repeating itself. And I'm hoping that the art somehow teaches people that it's enough. We need to figure out a different way not to torture each other. So this work, this next slide, it's my very first experiment to create a, a work related to time. So this piece has three different layers. I wanted to uh, recreate what Syria is for me and looking at it around, let's say, 3,000 years. You're, you're standing in front of the piece. You're somehow witnessing 3,000 years of history. The very far on the right side, we see Palmyra, and the left side is Aleppo Citadel. They're old, very old places standing intact. In the middle, we see different faiths exist next to each other, like mosques and, uh, you know, um, uh, maybe temples of uh, Armenian you know, churches and synagogues. They're all standing beautifully intact. The front layer, the front layer is what's happening the last 10 years. It's all these artifacts getting destroyed in front of us. So the only kind of representation of things from Syria is the last layer, which is 3,000 years ago around that time. The rest is all imaginary. What I want to create in my works I want to create this familiar space. I want to kind of play with the memory of people. When you're standing in front of the piece, you definitely say, oh, I've been here before, even though all of this is imaginary. But I want you to take with you, to take you with me to this imaginary take on what was there in the past and how we could use that thinking about how our ancestors telling us what to do next. So for example, this slide, the memories of the stone, I'm imagining, in Spain, 9th, 10th century, where different faiths, they were part of the same government. This is 1,000, like one century ago, they were like that. A thousand years later, where are we now? When you think about this. So the stones are whispering and telling us, what did you achieve until now? So it's somehow a lesson that I want people to see themselves like a mirror to figure out a way to change things in, in the way they, they interact with other cultures, other things. So this, the last one, which is, this is a, the image from inside. This piece is a part of a triennial, uh, seeing through Babel. Uh, growing up in Syria and, and learning and hearing different languages, I wanted to create a piece about humanity. So I'm just removing myself from geography. I'm removing myself from a specific location. I want to create a piece about all of us. I want to celebrate diversity and humanity in front of this piece. So here, I recreated Tower of Babel. Of course, many artists did create this. What I did, I wanted to create a piece that has two surfaces, facade, windows, and doors on the top. And what's hidden behind the windows and doors are sounds and calligraphy. So again, we, when we look at this, we remember that our ancestors, if you know the story of Babel, uh, there were one type of, let's say, one language speaking people were working to reach God. And then when God said, enough is enough, I'm going to curse you and change your language. So this way you cannot communicate and you stop reaching me. So I saw that this could be, the curse could be blessing. Why not to take that story and turn it around and say that, you know what? Let's celebrate diversity and look at artwork and all of us is part of it. So that's basically what I have right now at the Triennial. Thanks, thanks, Kavok. I, I think you know from based on what you said, you know, I'm 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 uh, motivated to ask my next question because I think both all three of you, you know, uh, really, you know, what your explanation, in your work is is suggesting a very simple kind of. I hesitate to use the word fact, but a simple kind of of of, of reality that that many things. Uh, in in our world today, have multiple meanings, and sometimes that meaning uh, is 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 multiple. is not reduced to a single, you know, sort of um, um, monopoly of of meaning because of shifting context. And you all have said, uh, you know, 
this idea of, of migration of diaspora, of the fact that the artist physically, you know, moving between contexts changes uh, the meaning of, of, of culturally specific uh, sort of uh, objects that you, 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 you work with in your work. So I'd like to ask uh, uh, the, the, the three artists, and two artists and one uh, artist duo that we have today to, and each of you have this, had this experience of migrating, of a diasporic uh, uh, sort of uh, journey in your life, but yet your work is also taking inspiration or it, there's a, a dialogue with a specific, a very specific, uh, you know, culture, a place, a, a history, you know, whether it's, it's Fukushima at that time and then Julia spoke, you know, you spoke about, uh, you know, leaving uh, Japan where you were born and, and, and so on. And, and of course, Nassim uh, also traveled a long way uh, and, and Kavok certainly, you know. Uh, how has this uh, sort of act of whether you call it migration or movement, you know, through various cultural contexts, how has that sort of uh, changed or inputted in your work or has and has it uh you know made you look at the culture that you you think you identify with 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 new new eyes uh, maybe we start with with let's start right at the beginning let's start with Nassim um I think we are constantly day by day are affected by this whole concept of um being affected but maybe daily is different um, especially like you can see in my work in the triennial that um, I'm holding on to this worry beads and it's almost like what we're trying to to talk about cultural differences and you just don't know daily if you want to hold on to your values of your past or ancestors as um, um, uh, we were just talking and, or do you want to let it go? Um, and is that like the help of others that we coming to this whole idea of dreaming um, together? Is that the whole people around you, the community with you are trying, we all go through this transition and then we look at things differently. Uh, with my work in specifically in this work in the triennial, the unworried is, I think we come to the acceptance somehow that we accept the changes, even though we very much try to resist and deny that we don't want to change at the beginning. And we come with set values of our memories and past and what we used to do, our habits with us. And then after a particular time when you're living in a new culture, you go through this phase of bargaining and compromising um, and then finally you accept and the point that you accept in your life, whatever it is, even with the coronavirus, even with the moving from one culture to another, it, I think coronavirus creating a culture itself by putting us through looking at things completely differently um, and it's no longer going to be the same as our past. So the past um, is with us pre-coronavirus but the future doesn't look like it and daily we constantly go through rejection and acceptance rejection and acceptance until we agree with ourselves what we want to grasp from our past and hold and what we want to let go and as you see in the beads that are scatters and then um, start again um, and my whole practice really worked with this um, as every year pass yeah, that's certainly, and very, I mean, it's just extraordinary how you have worked with these very, you know, sometimes almost minute everyday signifiers of culture, but really, in a sense, started to, to, to you know, question, you know, how these meanings start to shift all the time, you know, while, while it's still recognizably an object or an action from that particular culture. And, and I think the thing with fundamentalism and with, with you know, orthodox movements is they, they are trying, in a sense, to freeze that mutability, to say that, you know, this only means that it can never, 
you know, mean anything else, and it can never mean anything else for anybody else. Uh, I, and and I think you know your work is is critical in that that sense of constantly you know throwing us into this flux of of shifting context, you know, to resist that kind of of freezing of meaning. Uh, so so Ken and, and Julia, I mean, you're, you're, the two of you are among the most diasporic of artists here. I mean, judging from what Julia's, uh, you know, sort of biographical intro. So so how, I mean, what what kind of cultural context do you identify with uh, in your work? I, I mean, you, given that your life has actually been so mobile and moving in between so many different places. I mean, you were in Australia for a long time and now you're back in, 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 uh, uh, in, in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah we try, actually, uh, you know, uh, we have a uh, different background and uh, uh, I don't know how, uh, when the people see our works, so, uh, do you think they uh, feel, you know, cultural background? So we, uh, I don't know. So we uh, don't think about, uh, try not to think about it when we are creating artwork. And, uh, uh, you know, when I was in Australia, uh, uh, national television actually interviewed me and then uh, put me in uh, uh, for, you know, uh, the you know worldwide television and uh it was uh uh other and uh uh once uh, they made the uh the program i saw it and then uh you know the uh background music uh i heard it's like a you know uh Sha- japanese shakuhachi <laughs> and uh i was you know i yeah it seems like uh uh, sushi chef is uh, <laughs> making something, <laughs> and uh, you know the uh, the cultural uh, difference is very interesting. And uh, uh, sometimes you know the uh, lots of bias, and uh, yeah. So we actually, uh, ironically, we use uh, the music with uh, the work Three Wishes, exhibiting in uh, uh, Toyonare. It's called uh, uh, It's a Small World. Yes. Yeah. Do you know, uh, have you been to the uh, Disneyland? And the attraction is called uh, uh, It's a Small World? A no, small I haven't. World. And it's Tomorrow Tomorrowland. Tomorrowland. Oh, yeah. no, no. Yeah, It's a Small it's World. It's a Small World, yeah, yeah. And uh, we use it uh, ironically, the music, but uh, the, the music is really interesting. Uh, and also the attraction is uh, really interesting. And... Uh, Uh, Related to that, I was thinking, I mean, in in some ways, when I came back to Japan, it seemed to me like Japan was its own kind of music box, you know, like it's in its own bubble. Uh, So everything gets uh, mediated according to Japanese language and Japanese culture, which um, was very, in a way, is is quite isolationist, you know, it's it's very compact uh, in itself. Um, but then when being here and then going back to Australia, you also realize that, you know, Western societies do have their own bubbles. Uh, so, so we're all living in, in, a, in a particular way of seeing the world. You were talking about uh, Francis Fukuyama. Um, so even when it seems to be universalist, it actually has its own biases. Uh, so in this way, I think uh, having different cultures and experiences, you can, you can be outside of the Truman Show. You know, you can see that you are actually living in the bubble and knocking on the glass and, and, and then you understand that there's, you know, a different way of, of, of seeing, a different perspective. Yeah, and, and I think that's what, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I think is important about contemporary art uh, today that is actually showing the skeleton you know, or the, the structure of the bubble in your, your terms that we, we each of us create and, and live in. And I think, uh, you know, when we talk about clash of civilizations of values, it's actually because we, we cannot see beyond this or we are unable to see the container in which we, we are, are not just leave, living but perceiving uh, the world and, and, and your, your work in the triennial, I mean, Three Wishes, I thought it was, it was extraordinary, this sudden leap 
from, you know, the mutation of butterflies in Fukushima, very specific, very current. And then suddenly a kind of juxtaposition with something that happened in, in post-war America, much more kind of general. And when I first saw the work, the question that came to my mind was, wow, <laughs> ah, is Ken and Julia Yonatani asking us to consider the, this sort of cultural movement in the post-war era somehow sort of, you know, played a part in, in something that ultimately led to this, this very unfortunate and, and disastrous sort of incident. So that, that I think, you, you know, that, that is a great value because, you know, the, the, the sort of battles that are being fought now is, is precisely to, 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 you know, the, the forces of isolationism and tribalism is precisely aligned to make you forget that it is isolationist, that it is tribal. And, and I think art and artists just basically, you know, show you the skeleton, show you, you know, the container that uh, we, are, we, are, we are sort of placed in or we are creating. So Kavok, I mean, your, your work has a lot in your own words also to do with, with, with history and with the memory, with the mutation of memory and, and you know, of, of our own biography, but also culture uh, in general. So do you, what do you think, uh, in a sense, as an artist, you, you are hoping that, that the viewer or the, whoever encounters your work is sort of, looking at what what do you think they will take away from it what what is the response that you you are seeking from from the viewer at this point where i'm in my career and philosophy and arts i want to preserve culture and history so that's why i said earlier i'm creating this space when someone is in front of my piece i want them to uh, reimagine their own memory they're entering place where it doesn't exist anywhere, but it looks very, very familiar. But with that, uh, it's a take on how to preserve a culture, how to preserve, preserve historic places. And it, growing up in Syria, in Aleppo, uh, I, we, especially in, in my circle, uh, my parents, they're not interested in culture, unfortunately, and they never gave me any sorts of uh, uh, kind of influence what to do to preserve our own, my own family and ancestors. And the stereotype is in, 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 in my circle, you can do only one type of thing. If you're a painter, you can only kind of do a specific type of work. So when I came to uh, migrate to America and all of a sudden I realized the world is open in front of you, you can do anything you want. And I always wanted to experiment with different type of work. That's why I end up doing, you know, music with art and opera and, and performances. And, and especially in the West, we are fortunate to say what you want to say. And we're so lucky we have a platform, for example, like Asia Society, what we say it becomes magnified. It's amazing. So we don't have this luxury uh, in, in Syria or in Armenia, because what we do now, what we say now, it becomes so important and impactful. And this is unbelievable for time right now, because we can reshape, rechange, re redo things in culture and history. And we are so fortunate to, to be in a time like this where we think art could even change and influence politics. <laughs> well, we all wish. <laughs> That's, I think uh, there are many things that I think everybody, we're in a situation where everybody wishes <laughs> they could change the world. Literally. Yes, hopefully when they leave my piece, they will vote the right person. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've got... Uh, I just want to end with one, we're reaching the end of our hour. I just want to end with one final question, which at least uh, three people have asked me. They've texted me various uh, versions of this. It's interesting. I think because we've been talking about meaning and, and, and shifting meanings, uh, there's quite a few questions that, uh, that ask, you know, uh, to, to, to ask the artist, you know, why is art important at this moment? And, and a lot of people, of course, they are talking about in the age of Corona, you know, in this moment of, of uh, anti-Asian racism or, or BLM, there's quite a lot of uh, questions asking. Generally, the question is why, as an artist, do, should we pay attention to art in this moment, given that all of us individually are living in a moment of great stress and, and fracture? So I'd like to end by doing a round-robin response among us. Uh, 
uh, our speakers uh, as a takeaway for, and I'm answering basically four questions <laughs> by, by, or rather a question by four uh, people who've messaged me. Nasim? Um, for me, art um, at this point of our life is, is um, significantly a better way of being distracted from everything else that's happening around us um, in a very, um, in a very, thera- in a, like a therapy in a way um, that at the same time is marking history for the next generations. Uh, so what we make today, it would be looked at in 200 years time and uh, will be remarkable for those people of that next generation to look back and learn the way that Kevok is talking about how ancestors would um, help us to shape the future, has helped us to shape a future so we can do similar, deliver probably similar, uh, but but momentarily it's, it's extremely a, an important way of distracting your mind from um, the craziness and um, the, the, the whatever is happening in the bigger world, um, and and looking at it another way is um, not only distracting but focusing all this crazy mood in your um, surroundings to specifically what is now marking for the next generations. That's Thank how you. I. Th- Thank you, uh, Ken and Julia. Uh, definitely therapy. I would I would agree with that one. It's a form of therapy for for us. And then also uh, maybe a connection to redraw our connections. That we seem uh, with technology to be more and more connected, but at the same time really disconnected. So I think it's a way of reconnecting uh, with people, with cultures, with differences, and with the environment for us. Thank you. Uh, Kavo? I feel now more than ever, people in, in, in isolation, and they need, uh, when they come out, especially when they visit the museum, they are, they are so thirsty to, to touch, to see physical works. And we are so fortunate to give them hope give them individual stories because when you put individual story in the bigger picture it becomes much more interesting when you're reading or seeing a news and you see one child happen something and you're moving more so i think this is very important to give our story individually and give hope and comfort them we all need comfort to to move to the next phase which is hopefully it's going to pass soon thank you this is beautifully put and you know on this note of about the consolations of art, about how in our current moment of fracture and disaffection, you know, one of the great joys that art can bring is actually comfort and consolation. And uh, of course, uh, you know, as uh, one of our speakers has said, really about connection, that even though, you know, we're all living on social media, we're living through Zoom meetings now, you know, we still need connection because human beings are basically, uh, as the biologists will tell you, we are all social animals. We can't uh, survive on our own. You know, we can't all be monks or hermits. So on that note, you know, I would like to thank all our uh, participants today, Nasim Nasser, Ken and Julia Yonatani and Kavok Murad, who have taken time out and calling in not only from different geographies, but different uh, time zones. And once again, to encourage all our viewers to come and see the beautiful work of these three uh, artists in the Asia Society Triennial. The exhibition is free. Uh, with time ticketing, please go to the website asiasociety.org uh, slash triennial for information and do you know put your name on the email list to sign up for our other programs. So I look forward to seeing you uh, at some time soon. If not, then we'll see you on the net and we welcome you to the exhibition which continues on until February of 2021. Thank you and good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Have for a good everything. Good day, good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.